Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today is a bit of an unusual program. This is going to be an open-ended discussion without a particular topic, but with a very special guest. I'm honored to have with me in the studio Lynn Buchanan. He is the author of The Seventh Sense, Secrets of a Psychic Spy for the U.S. Military. He is also the founder and president of Problems, Solutions, Innovations, an organization through which he teaches and has taught for decades controlled remote viewing. Lynn was a member of the remote viewing program at Fort Meade, uh, and we're going to talk quite a bit about uh, his background and his experiences there, and he might even be asking me a few questions. We don't know exactly where this interview is going to go, but let me say this by way of introduction. I just had the opportunity last week for the first time to watch a popular movie, The Men Who Stare at Goats, and I discovered the lead character of that movie, a fellow named in, in the movie Lynn Cassidy. His first name is spelled L-Y-N, the same as Lynn Buchanan's spelling. And I, I think, welcome, Lynn. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a good introduction. Good to be here. <laughs> I, I realized that after I saw the movie that it's not just a coincidence that uh, the unusual spelling of your first name is no, it's not. the same as that yeah. in the movie. Uh, there are several things in that movie that actually happened with me. Now, the fact is, that movie tries to take into account actual events that happened, and they actually did happen, uh, over a span of almost 25 years. And it tries to take the people who did those events and put them into a small number of characters. And so, Lynn Cassidy... And every other character in that movie winds up being a compilation of many people. You'll find a lot of people saying, uh, George Clooney played me in the movie, you know. And um, the fact is that, yeah, he played many of the events that happened to me. He also played many of the events that happened to other people. It was a compilation in order to get all those events into the movie. And uh, the movie starts out with, you wouldn't believe how much of this is true, uh, except for the storyline itself, which is made up in order to encompass these events and people. Uh, it's true. It's mm -hmm. all true. Yeah. Well, Let's take, for example, the idea of staring at goats. You, in, in other words, harmful psychokinesis uh, applied towards uh, practice animals. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not only possible, it's actually very easy. Um, and um, uh, to be fair about it, okay, the goats were... Um, were medical training subjects and they would shoot these goats in the leg and in the and you know in the legs and they would maim these goats and then give the medical trainees the job of healing them and their entire lives these goats were being mutilated shot and all that and then healed only to be mutilated and shot and all that again and um the goat, I think it was ready to die. I think it was a relief for the goat, you know. But um, but the goat, of course, couldn't just will dying. But um, the um, the activity of um, of stopping the heart of an animal or a person. Um, Nina Kalagina over in Russia was doing this. Uh, she didn't know how to protect herself, and she died of a heart attack. Um, but the process is not only possible, it's actually very easy. Um, 
scarily easy, yeah. This was part of the training program at Fort Meade? No, it wasn't. Uh, no, uh, the training program at Fort Meade, uh, we were forbidden to do active mental work, uh, meaning causing things to happen, or what's normally called remote influencing or remote control. Uh, our unit was for intelligence gathering only, and they had very strict rules and threats of punishment if they ever caught us doing any active mental work. We were there to do passive mental work only. So collect intelligence and that's it. So uh, how is it that you are knowledgeable about the goats? Um, there were other units, but also uh, there was other tasking that I really won't go into. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, it's just like uh, uh, people ask about the work we did with UFOs. We were never officially tasked with any UFO or ET uh, uh, targets. We were never officially tasked with those targets. Okay. But I can well imagine that at Fort Meade, uh, the group of people who were in the program had some free time and were curious. Well, not only that, but uh, other people who did not officially task us were also <clears throat> curious. So but there, there was were, no official tasking. There was unofficial <laughs> activities, uh, I'm going to guess, of a wide variety. There were people who were curious. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And you were willing to oblige from time to time. If a four-star general comes in and tells the sergeant, I want, would you do something for me? Uh, the sergeant does it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, in the movie, uh, the character, Lynn Cassidy, who causes a goat, I guess, to die. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, feels a great deal of regret after that happened. And the plot of the movie, yes. that, that's sort of a turning point. Yes, it is. And uh, the <clears throat> sergeant who actually did that was not me. <clears throat> I killed the computers. I didn't kill the goat. Uh, but that was another sergeant. And, uh, and yeah, he, he had no protection for himself. He wasn't prepared for that. And he experienced the actual death of the goat and uh, uh oh yeah it it really affected him yeah adversely yeah well and, and i know there have been people who have been through the program and and had uh, psychological issues as a result of the difficulty of integrating that into a conventional lifestyle yeah in spite of the fact that uh we all got psychological tests before being allowed into the unit, and they were very stringent about that. They didn't want, they didn't want crazies or cuckoos or you know uh, kooks or loopy loop people in that unit because lives depended on the intelligence we gathered, and um, uh, a tremendous part of the tr training is that um, you don't put any personal bias into anything you find. You, it's like Sergeant Friday used to say, you know, just the facts, ma'am. And um, you get the impressions, you report the impressions, you do not interpret anything. Uh, it's uh, probably one of the purest forms of intelligence gathering there is. Uh, but that's because we were trained to not pollute the intelligence. And um, that's very hard. Uh, if I get two and two, I want to make four out of it. Mm -hmm. No, you have two and two. You know, uh, the example we give is uh, I'm viewing a site and I get something red, round, and rubbery. My tendency is to say, oh, it's a ball. No, it's a site that has something red. It's a site that has something round and something rubbery. What it is, I don't know. I just know there are those three things at the site. 
and it's not up to me to say what it is. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were trained very strenuously. Do not jump to conclusions, just the facts. You know, never make... In fact, uh, we were taught, do not use nouns. Describe, never identify. Yeah. Now, in the movie... There's another lead character besides Lynn Cassidy. I, I understand it, it based on Jim Shannon, who yeah. I think was the founder of, what was it called, Delta Force? Yeah. In the movie, it's called First Earth Battalion, I think. Uh, and no, it's uh, called, I forget what it's called in the movie, but uh, uh, First Earth Battalion is what uh, Jim always named his his unit, yeah. Were he you, was actually Delta Force, yeah. Uh huh. And uh, now I've met Jim. Uh, yeah. Uh, when he Great was alive, we yeah. really, really a lovely man. Yeah. And uh, I had uh, parenthetically, I might add some uh, uh, interesting experiences with the lady he eventually married, Joan Steffi. Yeah. Uh -huh. Which is another long story. She was involved with me in the Ted Owens research oh, really? that I did. Uh -huh. Uh, someday it'll be interesting if I can, can dig her up to talk about it. But yeah. um, did you at Fort Meade, did you interact with the 1st Earth Battalion and Jim Shannon? Not directly uh, while we were at Fort Meade. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I got a letter one day saying uh, that I was invited to join the Delta Force. And in my mind at the time, Delta Force was the Marines going out, jumping into the mud and, you know, and all that. And I thought, no way. And I just ripped the letter up. I didn't know that it was actually from Jim mm -hmm. inviting me to join uh, the 1st Earth Battalion. Mm -hmm. um, probably would have jumped at the chance to do it. Mm -hmm. So they were really completely separate. They were separate, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now... They were separate at our individual levels. Somewhere up the chain of command, the the thing forked off into the two different things. But somewhere up the chain of command, they were together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you were brought into the Fort Meade program, as I recall, by General Stubblebine. General Stubblebine, yeah. So, I mean, he might have been the one who was aware of both of these. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, back to the movie. The uh, one probably most accurate thing in the movie, uh, General Hapgood in the movie asks uh, Len Cassidy, did you code my computers with your mind? That's exactly what General Stubblebine asked me. And uh, at the time, I could see my great-grandchildren still paying for <laughs> computers, you know, and... Uh, I I was debating whether to lie about it or not, and I kind of just heard myself say, yes, sir, I did. And the grin that came across General Stubblebine's face was exactly the grin that came across the actor's face, uh, General Hapgood's face. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was exact. Far F and how to have I ever got a job for you? <laughs> and uh, uh, Bert, General Stubblebine, uh, wanted to take me to D.C. and start a unit where we would kill enemy computers with our minds, mm -hmm. mentally, and, you know, disrupt them with the end goal of being able to uh, control the enemy computers mentally and, you know, if they fired missiles at us, make the missiles drop into the sea or go back at them and um, disrupt the information and corrupt the information in the enemy computers and all that. And he had this whole project planned for doing this. And uh, Congress said, that smites of mind control. No. So there I was in D.C., um, he had already pulled me out of Augsburg, uh, so he really didn't have anything that he could do with me. So he took me out to the remote viewing unit and said, 
he's your problem now. <laughs> and uh, I went into the remote viewing unit, and uh, they read me on, which is where they tell you what the unit really does instead of what they say it does. And uh, I thought, I'm on candid camera. Come on, this is this is stupid. The military doesn't do this. And then over the next few weeks, I saw them working, and I thought, this stuff really works. And so um, they started training me, and uh, it's the neatest thing I've ever done in my life. It was it was just amazing. And you know, I thought maybe they can do it, but. I'm not psychic, you know, and uh, sure enough, most amazing job I've ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. And, and here you are many decades later still doing it. Trying to pass it on to others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And one of the most interesting things from my point of view, and we started to talk about this a little earlier, is the fact that uh, because of your computer skills while you were in the unit, you became the man managing the database. The database, yes. The uh, um, when this came out to the public, mm -hmm. um, it was called remote viewing. Mm -hmm. Now in the military, it was called coordinate remote viewing. Inga Swan, who created this, finally got um, discouraged with the fact that when it came out to the public, people were just saying, "Oh, I'm giving some random numbers, and so I'm doing coordinate remote viewing." And um, so he started calling it controlled remote viewing with the knowledge that the remote viewing is controlled. And also the knowledge that the general public would say, I don't want to be controlled, hmm. you know. And so people stayed away from controlled remote viewing that is sub separate. Now, the fact is that uh, in the controlled remote viewing that we did, we analyzed every perception. We databased it according to the feedback. And we found out that some viewers are great at colors. Some are great at shapes. Some are great at relationships, everything else. And um, we found that we could actually identify strengths and weaknesses of individual viewers through databasing. And uh, so the database became the backbone of controlled remote viewing in such a way that uh, now we have uh, we have civilian teams out in the civilian arena who are doing uh, the uh, remote viewing for uh, police work, businesses, and research, and all that, and. Uh, they can go through their, uh, we have one who has a bevy of 25 highly trained professional level remote viewers. And uh, she gets a task in and she can go through and say, okay, what type of information do I need to answer this task? She can look in the database and she can say, to answer question number one, I need this viewer. Number two, I need this other viewer. And as a result, can come up with over 90% accuracy because she's pulling on the strength of each and every viewer. What I learned from you recently, which actually surprised me, is that the same ba database that you developed at Fort Meade, you're, you're working with now many, many decades later. Yes, and it's open to all controlled remote viewers. Mm -hmm. um, remote viewing has become the new age term for psychic. And so when somebody says they're a remote viewer, um, most people don't know what remote viewing means, that it came from controlled remote viewing. Um, and so you have palm remote viewers, pendulum remote viewers, crystal ball remote viewers, tea leaf remote viewers, and so on. And um, you can't database these things. The uh, the strength of the method that Inga Swan created is everything can be databased, it can be analyzed, it can be controlled, and it puts the viewer in total control of the process of the psychic process. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, most natural psychics are at the mercy of their talent. Um, a controlled remote viewer is not. They're in control of their talent. Because the methodology is so precise. That's right. And the controlled remote viewing is the methodology. It's not the psychic part. It's the methodology. Mm -hmm. What we teach is control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know in an earlier interview, if I recall correctly, you pointed out to me that really what the control remote viewing process is about is how to take the psychic information that's available right. to everybody mm -hmm. and bring it up from the subconscious mind to conscious awareness. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh-huh. In a controlled manner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, when you, <clears throat> when you get out on the internet, and you hear about remote viewers and remote viewing and all that, uh, generally, you say to a remote viewer, oh, what do you do? Oh, I use a pendulum or something like that. Um, that is totally different from a controlled remote viewer. Yeah. Yeah. And so the database, uh, no matter who teaches, we have qualified teachers, and we qualify them to teach controlled remote viewing no matter who your trainer is the database is a universal database for controlled remote viewers mm -hmm. so i suppose it's probably fair to say that today the people who have been trained in that particular method of remote viewing constitute i'm going to say off the top of my head maybe 20 25 percent of people who are doing remote viewing no I would say more like uh, four to five percent. Four to five percent. Yeah, uh, because everything now is called remote viewing. Mm. So, um, but uh, the um, the people who work in controlled remote viewing work together. They share controlled remote viewers and all that. Mm -hmm. Also, you hear a lot about remote viewing, but you hear very little about controlled remote viewing. Because it was designed in the military for application purposes, for operations. And now in the civilian arena, the controlled remote viewers and the people who use teams of controlled remote viewers sign non-disclosure agreements. And so they can't talk about what they do. Uh, if they work for the government, they have to have the security clearances so they can't talk about what they do. And so you rarely ever hear of controlled remote viewers um, just simply because it it is so highly accurate that uh, basically everybody wants to keep it secret. But also um, because generally... Everybody says, controlled remote viewer, oh, you're a psychic. Mm. And for most people in the world today, psychic is a four-letter word. Not you know, to me. I, I, it's not to me either. You know, yeah. it's, uh, I, um, I see many <clears throat> good natural psychics, and I just think, on my best day, I wish I could do that, mm. you know, because I'm, I'm trained to do a, a certain method. And um, I may take two hours to get information going through the step-by-step -step method. And a true good natural psychic can just, the answer is. And I think, how do they do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you mentioned to me earlier that uh, the subtitle of your book, The Secrets of a Psychic Spy. The Psychic Spy, you, you yes. You didn't want the publisher to use that subtitle. No, uh-uh. Um, I didn't want him to use the word psychic, yeah. uh, because that just throws you into the big pool. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yeah, the controlled remote viewing uses your psychic ability in an organized manner. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we were psychic spies. That's true. And, uh, that's, I mean, that's what we did. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, um, oh, I think, you know, about the, uh, uh, thing Joe McMonagall did uh, for the Boomer submarine. Yes. They had no idea what was in that building. He mentally went into the building, drew pictures of the submarines, drew 
floor plans of the buildings, and uh, and we we did that on a normal basis. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but the minute you say psychic, everybody is, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Well. Well, there's so many questions I, I can ask you. Uh, let me ask you this one. There, when one thinks of remote viewing, it's as if you know that you're in a barracks or in an office somewhere yeah. and you're looking, receiving mental impressions of a target. Yeah. But there's also, uh, as you described, you went into the building, or Joe McMonagle did, a, a kind of bilocation. Where Mentally, you're, yeah. Where you're really uh-huh. there. Yeah. It's not quite the same as viewing. It's more like being there. There comes a point in controlled remote viewing. Uh, I don't know if this happens with natural psychics. When they say they bilocate, they describe it, and it's not the same. Uh, But in controlled remote viewing, there comes a time at a very high level when all of a sudden uh, you can't tell you're not at the target. Uh, you feel the wind on your face. You feel the sun. Uh, you hear the sounds. It's you cannot tell that you're not really there. You're not really there. Uh, and it's not an out of body experience. Um, out of body, you can pass through walls and things like this. It's a virtual reality experience. Like when you put the goggles on, that moment when you buy into it, mm-hmm. you know, it becomes real. And um, it's that moment in controlled remote viewing where you totally buy into it. And uh, and you're supposed to write everything down in controlled remote viewing. There's no table. There's no pen in your hand. There's, there's no paper. You can't tell you're not at the site. And uh, this has happened to me several times, and uh, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. It really is. Um, Ingo Swan said, never let a remote, a controlled remote viewer do that because they quit reporting. Mm. And uh, I live for it. Uh (laughs) It's great. Mm -hmm. I did an interview uh, with my friend Jason Reza Giorgiani not oh, so yeah. long yeah. ago, mm-hmm. and he I told me a story. I think it came from you about uh, doing uh, where you were tasked, or perhaps you knew who the viewer was to uh, to be on the airplane uh, that was over Lockerbie when the flight exploded. Oh yeah, yeah, I got that one. Yeah, uh-huh. that was you. That was me. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh-huh. and. Uh, yeah, that was not a pleasant target. Yeah. yeah. But you had the the feeling of actually you know, being there in the plane and watching. Absolutely, the, and, and dealing with the whole situation. And, uh, and they ran me through the plane to the point of the explosion, found the case, and, and uh, actually identified it. And uh, I hear, I heard that uh, from that, uh, from the results that we did, because everybody in the unit did that, uh, that they actually used that intelligence to find the actual source of the case and track it back to who had put it on the plane and all mm-hmm. that, yeah. Uh, part of uh, the description that Jason shared with me was the idea that as, as the explosion was occurring, uh, people were dying, and you yes. were able to experience how uh, their consciousness uh, left their bodies, and they yes. became aware of you. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, and the confusion, the fear, all of that, uh, mm-hmm. and having bilocated. You can't tell that you're not there. So uh, I was getting all wrapped up in the emotions of it and, you know, uh, as though it were happening to me. And, uh, yeah, it was not a, that was not a pleasant target. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We got the job done. Well, I guess there are many instances in, in which the psychic people report uh having experiences of, of a negative nature, a murder or an accident or 
Well, yeah, mm-hmm. and if you're going to work for the police, uh, a lot of people tell me that they want to learn the controlled remote viewing so they can bring home missing kids and all that. And I warn them ahead of time. I say, you know, if you're going to access these kids, find out where they are and what happened to them, you're going to witness some things that you really are never going to be able to forget. And they're not pleasant things. And, you know, uh, this is one of those where you're wanting to go where angels fear to tread, you know. And uh, and there are some of these things, you know, uh, you go to find a missing kid and you experience that kid, even observing it, uh, being molested, tortured, chopped into pieces and spread across an acre of land. Uh, do you really want to, you know, do you really want to experience that? And so I warn people ahead of time, and many times they'll realize and they'll say, no, I don't. And I'll say then, okay, if that's your only reason for learning remote viewing, take up basket weaving. You know, it's it, it just don't do it. You know, it takes a special personality to do that kind of work and special training too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, I know, uh, and I've talked to other remote viewers who are in the Fort Me program. There's been a lot of curiosity about certain unsolved mysteries, particularly in relationship to UFOs. Yeah. I, I assume maybe th- that you also were curious about that. Very, very much so. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's, <clears throat> there's one question about the UFO. I won't go into it. It's a long explanation. That uh, I have tried for years to find the answer to it, and uh, and I've had other highly qualified remote viewers. Uh, try to find the answer to and the uh, the answer seems to be some kind of technology that's beyond anything we can understand right now mm. and uh, uh, so that's you know I think the only way to find an answer is for me to abduct an alien <laughs> <laughs> for you to abduct an for alien for me to abduct them yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, and get into their ship and tear it apart you know mm-hmm. which I'm sure somebody's already done but anyway mm-hmm. uh, so you but you have made an effort to use remote viewing to learn something about the UFO mystery oh absolutely yeah many things uh, and uh, and have gotten absolute proof real world confirmation back on quite a bit of it mm-hmm. uh, for example uh, everybody says oh they're so much more advanced than we are not always true uh, we found out long ago that you can move things by exploding them by exploding something and it'll blow things out of the way mm-hmm. they found that you can move things by magnetism we have taken the exploding idea, <clears throat> captured it, made it into rockets, made it into internal combustion motors and all that, so that we move things basically by exploding gas and fuel. Over that same period of time and longer, they have taken the same, you can move something with a magnet, and developed it into their way. Now then... You go through space, you can't take enough fuel to go through space. But planets have magnetism. Mm -hmm. And using magnets, you can use the planets to guide your ship and to power it. Okay? And uh, uh, you know how a UFO will go slowly over the land. And then the reports are it shoots up. You have a magnetic drive over an iron core planet. It's dangerous to the pilot and all the ground, the magnetic field varies as you go across. So as they fly low, they're going to fly slow. 
because if they don't, they're going to hit all those bumps and crash. Mm -hmm. But when they want to go fast, they have to get away from all that irregularity, so they immediately shoot up, and then they can go fast. Mm -hmm. It's because they have magnetic drives. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they're more advanced than we are. It just means they advanced in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I could ask many more questions yeah. about UFOs. Okay. <laughs> uh, have you looked into the uh, types of uh, persons or individuals uh, that are operating these devices? Well, yes. Um, unofficially, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, also, um, we, both in the unit and outside the unit, uh, we found four ET bases that are right here on Earth. There are probably more. We have identified four and gotten absolute uh, confirmation on one. And in fact, I think we dis discussed this in yeah. a previous interview. Yeah, I think we did. Yeah. And, um, yeah, the, um, yeah, after I got out of service, we discussed this too, I think. Uh, I was asked to do a uh, a study comparing human psychic ability with ET psychic ability. And uh, now the ETs are in, there are thousands of thems, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but when it comes to comparison of psychic ability, I was able to, by going through the documented records and all that, uh, not by remote viewing, but going through the documented records, I was you able to UFO literature. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. uh, stuff that didn't literature? stuff that didn't get into blue book and uh -huh. stuff like that. From um, the military files. Files. Okay. Files of research organizations. I, I'm carefully wording this. Files. Files. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, I was able to cut them into four, friendly and unfriendly, mm -hmm. highly psychic and not very psychic. Okay. And uh, that cuts them into four categories. Yeah. The now, the grays are in all four. Mm -hmm. The, you know, each species out there will have somebody in each one of the four. Okay. The, uh, what I found from the, documentations was basically that the unfriendly non-psychic ones don't like us they don't come here except by accident um, the friendly non-psychic ones are here for trade that's it that's it they just want trade the friendly psychic ones are very interested in us developing our abilities the friendly, I mean, the unfriendly psychic ones, they want to wipe us off the planet. They they just want us dead. And uh, I couldn't figure out on those last two why, what was, what's in it for them. Okay. And uh, one document gave me the answer I came up with, which is, my interpretation, okay, I'm not saying it's absolute truth, but it's my interpretation of all these studies, and it's what I put into the document that it later turned in and was classified and disappeared. Um, and that is that um, from this one incident, the psychic ETs are more psychic than we are. They're more powerfully psychic than we are. But they have to be right over you. They have no range at all. Okay? And they have to be right over you in order to capture you and all this other stuff. Humans have very weak psychic ability, but we have range that goes through time and space. We can see across the universe as easily as we can see across the room. If we develop our strength and maintain that range, when we get into space, 
we will be a major power in space. That's why our friends want to help us and our enemies want us dead. Now that's my interpretation Mm -hmm. of what I saw. Based on having access to files. To files, yes. Uh, Okay. To documentation, right. Uh And how about, have you endeavored to use remote viewing to validate any of this information? Uh, Not really, because I wouldn't get feedback anyway. Yeah. So, you know, why bother? Uh, The possibility of feedback is crucial. uh, It really is if you're going to judge what you're doing and database what you're doing. Yeah. Um, But also, you know, uh, if I found out that information, so, um, if I'm going to sit down and do a two or three hour session, I'm going to try to bring home a missing kid. Uh, what the ETs do I don't have any say so in that but if I can help bring home a missing kid oh yeah mm-hmm. you know, or a missing soldier uh, then I'm not going to waste my time on ETs I really don't care about it mm-hmm. uh, you know they're there I know they're there they're here I know they're here and so what um that doesn't get my trash out to the street on Friday morning. <laughs> and so. Well, I promised the viewers in our introduction that this would be kind of free for all oh, it has conversation. Been. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm going to, if you have any questions you'd like to pose to me, uh, maybe this is a good time. I actually would. Um, you have the only parapsychological degree in the U.S., in the world, as far as I know. Doctoral diploma that says parapsychology from an accredited university, yes. And I've seen that, and I've often wondered, first of all, how you rammed that through a college, uh, a university, to get that, to get them to do that. Also, what kind of static you got from faculty, staff, and your peers And before that, what got you interested in parapsychology in the first place? Was it an event? Was it knowing somebody? What started all this for you? You have done so much work in this field. And I just want to know, where did that come from? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I think, Lynn, I was drawn to it as a uh, undergraduate in college. Okay. Really. I, you know, growing up, I grew up in Wisconsin. I had a very conventional upbringing. Yeah. My father ran a furniture store. I sort of imagined as a child I might go into the furniture business. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And But when I got into college, I um, learned about, uh, you know, browsing through the library. Oh, yeah. I found uh, books on ESP yeah. and yeah. books on life after death and yeah. in the uh, library. And so uh, I was drawn to psychology. I got an undergraduate major in psychology. And also, to be honest, that was in the 1960s. And mm-hmm. college students uh, at the time were experimenting with drugs. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And and so I had psychedelic experiences uh-huh. that sort of really opened me up. Oh, uh, good. And and I began doing ESP research as an undergraduate in my mm-hmm. experimental psychology classes. Yeah. And I, I did a senior honors thesis on the psychology of religious mysticism. Neat. When I started it, I sort of imagined that these people who call themselves mystics and say they see ghosts, it's, it must be some form of uh, mental illness, and that's what I'll write about. Yeah. But as I delved into the literature, I quickly discovered that some of the most highly functioning people in our society, the Eleanor Roosevelt's and mm-hmm. Albert Einstein's, uh, were people who were reporting mystical experiences. Right. Mm-hmm. So. By the time I got out of college as an undergraduate, I uh, was already pretty uh, convinced that this this was a, an important area worth exploring, mm-hmm. and that just sort of it kept going on awesome. and on. Good. After that, I began having 
some profound experiences of my own that good uh-huh. I, I began uh, if people want to know the details they're in the in presence yeah, a series uh-huh. of monologues yeah. that are they can check a link to the first one right now I can put a link in the upper right hand corner of the oh, video good. screen uh-huh. yeah because I've talked about those things but what I haven't ever talked about is at the university uh, getting a doctoral degree. I managed to set it up. I had dreams. I was being guided by dreams mm. that gave me the uh, confidence to, to do all of this and mm-hmm. the connections. Yeah. But then as I got closer and closer to completing the doctoral degree, the university put more and more obstacles in my path. And, and it got mm-hmm. so bad that even after my graduate committee had approved my dissertation and awarded the degree and I had a graduation ceremony, the skeptics were so outraged that they endeavored to get the university to revoke my degree. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. I had to fight. Uh, 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 and not only that, they went further than that. They ended up, uh, in effect, libeling me publishing an article in Psychology Today magazine that, mm-hmm. in effect, said, you know, this Mishlove probably didn't even get the degree because they were hoping I wouldn't. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And, and, but if he did get it, he certainly didn't deserve it. He, he, he's an incompetent <laughs> fraud. That's right, yeah. So I had to fight a libel suit for six years. Really? After I got the degree, yeah. That's a, it's a shame that it has to be that way. Yeah, it really is. Um, one of the reasons I'm asking is um, at the IRVA conference, International Remote Viewers Association conference this year, uh, I'm giving a talk about the White Crow event. Do you know what the White Crow event is? The White Crow event. No. Yes. Um, I forget what philosopher. Um, William James. No, uh, there was uh, starts with an H. I don't know. I'll look it okay. up again. Um uh, said that um, if you believe that all crows are black and you can, you're can, you convinced of it, you're totally convinced of it, all it takes is one white crow to shatter that belief. William James is attributed to that. Uh, it was actually done before that. Yeah. It, oh, okay. it came from he a, found it from someone else, but then he yeah. went on to say Mrs. Piper, the medium whom he worked with, was yeah. his white crow. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, most people come into this field because at some point in their life, they've had that white crow. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no such thing as psychic. There's no such thing as psychic. But you know what happened to me one time, you know, and they always go back to that one white crow event. Mm -hmm. Because of Irva, society is now having its white crow event. When this first came out to the public, um, I was getting calls to be on radio shows and all that, and they were making fun of it and, you know, if you're so psychic, why ain't you rich and all this other stuff? And um, they're not making fun of it anymore. And nowadays you talk to people about remote viewing and, oh, I know, I've heard of that, you know. And um, and they're not laughing when they say I've heard of that. Uh, so the acceptance of this wonderful human ability is coming more and more into fruition. And um, that society itself is having its white crow event, largely thanks to Irva and uh, and to the number of people who are now willing to say, you know, something happened to me one time. Yeah. and uh, And they're not ashamed to say it anymore. I think we're uh, seeing a, a turning of the corner. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think your work, the military. The, yeah. Uh, but I feel very lonely still in having, you know, the oh, only yeah. doctoral diploma. I would like to see uh, 
uh, an army of parapsychologists. Maybe I can get uh, my honorary doctorate in, in that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we now have hundreds of these interviews on the New Thinking Aloud channel. It's If somebody were to watch all of them, it would be the equivalent, probably not of a doctoral degree, yeah. but, but certainly a, a very serious undergraduate major in parapsychology well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just by watching these videos. That's right, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you have done an amazing amount of work and uh, and the dedication that you have given to all of this and continue to give. Listen, uh, I speak for a lot of people when I say we really appreciate what you're doing. I mean, we really do. Um, and I have found um, like I go on coast to coast or something like that. And uh, they say, you know, here's your website and your teaching courses and all this. I rarely ever get students from it. Mm. Uh, almost every time I've been on your show, somebody calls me, I want to be a student. Well, that's a good thing. It is a good yeah. thing for me, yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're part of a community. That's why we're that's right. in the corner. Yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, I, of course, like to encourage my viewers to mm-hmm. share the news, spread it around. That's right. Uh, yeah. Especially the announcements on social media. Mm-hmm. Let people, more and more people know about this because it strikes me, Lynn, that, you know, our society, our civilization, I think, in some ways is in a crisis. Very much so. Oh. Uh, and headed toward a worse crisis, too. Yeah. Uh, and, and if we're going to get through this crisis, it seems to me that people becoming more aware of their own inner being and their own inner potentials is probably the single most important thing. The human mind is capable of so many things. And uh, the crisis that's coming, not everybody's going to make it through it. Uh, and those people who learn what they're capable of doing and what they can do, uh, have head and shoulders above chance, above those who are not going to make it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, largely what I'm doing every day, uh, (laughs) practically three times a week, we're uploading these programs. Oh, yeah. The message keeps getting repeated in different ways over and over Uh again. Like, look within yourself. You've got enormous potential. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The human mind is just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It really is. And, you know, I look at all that we can do with the controlled remote viewing. Uh, read documents and safes and, and do, you know, do the floor plans of the place where the hostage is being held so that the rescuers won't get the hostage killed as they rescue them and, and, um, and read the plans and intentions of foreign leaders and all this. We're still in kindergarten. Mm-hmm. We really are. Uh, we just barely scratch in the surface of what the human mind can do. And, uh, I, I, I'm at the point of being 80 years old and thinking, all I want is like 300 more years. <laughs> that's, that's all I'm asking for. That's not too much. <laughs> well, as long as I'm alive, you are always welcome to come back. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you. I hope that we both live a long time because I'd love oh, to yeah. be doing, you know, hundreds of more of these interviews. Yeah. Uh-huh. I see we're having an impact. I want to keep it going. It, you really are having an impact. You really are. And are you? Well, I try. Yeah. I mean, we've had, for example, now several interviews with Laurie Williams. Oh, yeah. One of your students who is now one of the world's foremost trainers. And highly qualified and certified. Yeah. Uh, we are uh, <clears throat> getting the legal thing to have a certification that can go on the website or, or the documentation of a certified crv or uh, CRV trainer mm-hmm. uh, to distinguish them from remote viewers in general. You know? and, and Lori has described on this program all of yeah. the steps you put her through, the years of training oh, that yeah. it took for her to get to the point where uh, you were willing to qualify her as a trainer. Oh, yeah. 
And uh, I have people who go through the course and say, can I train now? I say, you can tell people what you know, train people, help people, people learn, but you're not qualified. No, you're not going to train. And if you do train somebody else, don't charge them money for that training because I will come get you over that <laughs> <laughs> because you're not qualified. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you want to teach your spouse, your friends, your relatives how to do this, yeah, teach them. You know, uh, it's that tide that raises all ships, mm -hmm. you know. So by sticking with controlled remote viewing and setting very high standards and by keeping a very accurate database that goes back for decades, yes, uh, you, you are really working to establish CRV as a uh, serious profession. It is a serious profession already. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, we don't have full-time, you know, 40-hour-a-week. Uh, professional remote viewers but we have professional we have remote viewers who are qualified to do professional level work because yeah. they have established their track record they have established databases uh, they have dependability ratings that are uh, so high above chance that there's no denying it you know um, in fact uh Michio Kaku, that's his name, you know, yeah, the uh, was on uh, Star Talk mm -hmm. the other night. And he came out, was unpopular with their host, but uh, he came out and he said, Did you know that there's data now showing that telepathy, uh, psychic predictions, and all that, it has been proven scientifically that it happens and it works. And he said, it works. And the host, of course, had, had changed the subject. Yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah, even in the scientific community. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I like to let people know, for example, that the American Psychological Association, which mm -hmm. has traditionally been pretty hostile oh, to yeah. parapsychology, yeah. after uh -huh. all, psychologists are trying, they're on the bottom rung of the pecking order among yeah. scientists, uh -huh. so they're, they're, they feel many times threatened by parapsychology. They don't want oh, yeah. to have anything to do with it, largely, but they published in their flagship journal in August of uh, 2018, as I recall, a, an article summarizing a meta analyses of parapsychology mm -hmm. studies that included over 1400 experiments oh, yeah. uh -huh. showing overwhelming statistical significance. That's right. Uh, one of my students, Dr. David Shaver, is a uh, pretty high ranking member in that mm -hmm. and is uh, now being sought out to give talks on um, specifically controlled remote viewing the psychological aspects of it yep. and so on. Also, um, uh, David Ritchie, Dr. David Ritchie, um, up in New England, mm. has written a book called The Hiss of the Asp. H-I-S-S -S is Histological Informational Survey of uh, something. Asp is the anomalously sensitive person mm -hmm. where he compares psychics, controlled remote viewers, and um, um, borderline psychotics, oh. and shows the similarities, shows the differences, and actually shows where the controlled remote viewing and most of the psychic work has nothing to do with borderline psychosis, mm -hmm. which is one of the psychological yeah, establishment's famous thing. Yeah, people assume sometimes ignorant people assume if you're talking about paranormal things, it means you're uh, you're crazy. on the edge of psychosis. That's right. Yeah, yeah. and uh, he has done a study. He has a book out called his his of the ass. ass. Doctor David Ritchie, mm -hmm. and uh, excellent book, and I mean thoroughly, thoroughly researched. Well, I hope I can uh, invite him on this program. Oh, that would be neat. Yeah. He's an interesting person to talk to. Yeah. 
Well, Lynn Buchanan, this has been a delightful conversation. Thank uh, you. I've enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for, for inviting me here. Thank you for coming to Albuquerque. Oh, yeah. Come back often. You're welcome anytime. I hope we have many more opportunities. Together. Oh, thank you. We weren't sure about the snow. Oh, this won't go into the <laughs> <laughs> when it snowed like it did yeah. yesterday mm-hmm. in D.C. Mm-hmm. We used to go down, take our lunch down, and sit on the park bench so we could watch the Arabs try to drive in it. <laughs> and you know, uh, a car we'd go by and we'd say, "Nope, Florida plates." <laughs> They'd be skidding up. Nope. Southern California. And a car would go zoom through the snow. That's a Texan. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, one of, you know, spectator sports are where you find them. Hmm. Yeah, we'd go down, sit on a park bench in this heavy snow. Hmm. Just to watch people trying to drive through it. Well, I, I know you were originally scheduled to be here tomorrow, uh, but you're here That's today right. because of the because know, of the snowstorm. Because yeah. of the snowstorm, yeah. well, I'm very grateful that you're here. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you for being with me. Well, thank you for the invitation, and thank you for being thank you. with us. Yeah.